All right. Well, Ken, why don't you go ahead? We're, we're I think uh, most who will be here are in here. Lord, we come to you tonight. Grateful for this opportunity we have to come together on this platform at this time to learn from this book of origins. We ask that you be with us so we may listen to the lessons presented, find applications to apply to our lives. Be with us in all that we do. In the name of your son, amen. Amen. Thanks. All right. Well, tonight is a an extremely all these first lessons are lessons where it these things have affected us since the beginning. And uh, and tonight, of course, the uh, the fall fall with a capital F, as you read about it in commentaries and other uh, journals and things, uh, this this initial fall of mankind uh, from his place of beauty and rest, communion with God to a, to a place of uh, separation and struggle and a lot of uh, implications for us uh, today. And, uh, but first, before we do that, a couple things from last week. Um, uh, uh, the song uh, Jehovah uh, Jireh was, uh, uh, was brought up, I think by Gretchen. And um, it's, I'm not going to try to sing it because I've never sung it, but uh, in a very simple song, I just thought I'd uh, the, uh, read the lyrics, uh, Jehovah Jira, my provider, and that's what we talked about last week, how God was a provider, how he was willing to provide in so many different ways. His grace is sufficient for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jira, my provider, his grace is sufficient for me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. He will give his angels charge over me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me, for me, for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. He cares for me. Jehovah Jireh cares for me. And uh, that's how it ends. So anyway, um, and I think it's in a minor key from what I recall. I think I've heard it a few times and uh, it is it is a beautiful song. You probably can look it up somewhere on YouTube if you want to want to hear it. And then the other thing that came up last week that I... Um, uh, said I'd look into is uh, verses 10 to 14 of Genesis 2, and the fact that the the verb concerning the rivers that we don't know their location is in the past tense, and then concerning the Tigris, it's in the present sense, which flows east of Assyria, and then there isn't a verb associated with the Euphrates. And, um, and unfortunately, most people just kind of don't talk about that in their commentaries, um, which isn't a, a huge giant surprise, but one book I found uh, that does did talk about that at least a little bit is the uh, Zondervan Illustrated Bible Backgrounds Commentary, which is absolutely fabulous. These comment there are five volumes for the Old Testament. Um, they're not crazy expensive; they're twenty to thirty dollars each, I think, on Amazon. I think three of mine are used, and two of them are new. Just I was able to pick them up here and there. Um, but they, they are fabulous. And here's a picture that was in um, concerning these verses, a picture of this area. Um, and uh, it says, uh, satellite imagery shows the track of an ancient, long, dried up riverbed flowing across Saudi Arabia, northeast to the Persian Gulf that some identify with the, the Pishon. Uh, we have the Pishon and the Gihon are the ones that uh, we don't know where they're at. And then the, the top part of that page, actually, you can see some commentary there about those uh, rivers. And also, I guess, mentioning there the, from uh, Uruk, um, some, some artwork that shows four rivers um, or waters flowing forth. And it turns out that a lot of the ancient Near East uh, creation stories do mention uh, water, mention rivers, sometimes four, sometimes two. Um, and they mention like things like people walking around naked and other things that are semi-associated with the biblical story. But the interesting thing, none of them talk about Eden being a paradise type of situation, a place of, of comfort or hope, which is which separates those from uh, the true, the true narrative, the true story 
which we find in the in the Bible. So th there's a I'm not going to read all that, um, but um, I did want us to notice, and I put some dates over here on the right. It is estimated that the river dried up between 3,500 and 2,000 BC over here in the in the right column. And that would fit from when the flood is. So Ken had mentioned last week, of course, the flood would change all of this. And, you know, that certainly fits with what they've seen from the satellite imagery and other, other archaeological um, uh, situations. So, um, so this makes sense. You know, the, the flood, maybe all four rivers were in existence until the flood. Um, and those dates are just approximate, uh, but, but, you know, decently close. And so by the time Moses would have written these, it would make sense that he would use the past tense um, for the first ones and then the present tense for the later ones because uh, the, the Gihon and the Pishon uh, would have been long dried up uh, by the time Moses was actually writing. So, uh, and of course he has the uh, advantage of inspiration as well, but it, it fits with all the evidence that we have. And the date for David, that's just, just for reference, but that's when he took the throne approximately. He would have been born uh, before that. He would have, anyway, just a but good, good round numbers to help us when we're trying to think through uh, biblical history there. Um, so any, no, no great answers. The last sentence in this whole thing says, none of these options may be adopted with any confidence. <laughs> so anyway, so all this information and then boom, you know, we just don't know, but uh, but uh, uh, but George to directly answer the question. You know, no one really talked about the past tense, present tense of those uh, of those verbs. Uh, interestingly enough, but uh, but I thought this was all interesting. Um, anyone want to make any comments or observations or give me some more stuff to look at? I really enjoyed this, by the way. <laughs> uh, but if you do, just just speak up, of course. So, all right, tonight, uh, chapter three, uh, verses one to 19, just unbelievable information here in these verses um, as, we, as we go through this. In the introduction, we, uh, were re we, some verses were referenced, um, James 1, 13 to 15. Let no one say when he's tempted, I'm being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. And of course, we see that with Eve, or we'll see it in just a minute. Um, then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings, brings forth death. Um, also, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. No temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation, he will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Um, a couple things here. We, we want to be tempted as little as possible. So it is good for us to avoid situations that put us in a place of being lured or enticed. Uh, in the booklet, uh, uh, Chad brings up, you know, why was Eve so close to that tree anyway? You know, why was she even in the proximity of it? And sometimes the, the same could be true, you know, for us. Why would we put ourselves in a situation where we know we might be enticed or lured? And um, um, anyway, so just a, a good point there. Um, and I've got another point on these, but Susan, go ahead first. Or Chris. I see yes. Your hand. Okay. Your, <laughs> your, your hand shows up blue on my screen, the little okay. blue hand. Go ahead. Chris and I, Chris and I are one, so. Okay, <laughs> um, yes. Difference between, I'm just curious your thoughts, I have your thoughts, difference between he won't tempt us, but he will test us. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> I try to bring great questions. <laughs> and I, I'm, I'm not, I, I will make some comments about that. Um, but yeah, that's what, but there, there is, it's interesting because we're told in um, either First Peter or James, and I'm sorry, I can't reference it, but I wasn't, I wasn't thinking about it before you asked that. Um, you know, we're told to consider, um, oh, how, it's, how is it worded? Consider suffering um, a, a test or a gift from God. Uh, it doesn't say gift there, but 
but can but could but take it that way and so and and i um i've i've preached on that passage a few times and upset a few people a few times but then once it's once we talk about it more then they kind of feel better about it um and so when we face trials and possibly temptations you know that verse says consider it or pretend like it is a test from god um and you know just to to help you deal with it and grow from it 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 still doesn't mean god wanted it um now god definitely you know i mean there's no getting around you know god tested abraham i think the bible uses the word tested um but the to tempt with evil to to try to get someone to sin that's not god's that's not god's uh, job um he doesn't do that he he's on our side and so he he's never trying to get us to sin and um and so tempt with evil that might be part of the way to kind of separate that out now if we are tempted if, if we're tempted with evil if you know if satan you know if he tempts us then there's a sense in which we can say well you know what if we handle this the right way god's going to bring growth from it and i think this is part of god being able to bring good out of all things even bad things uh romans 8 you know he, he will work all things together for good uh for the people who love him uh, but that's a that's a that's a good question susan and it's a really tough one and it's it's not one i don't think there's an easy answer uh, for it except to accept all these true statements we have and then to the best of our ability as human beings try to try to put those together uh, george think, why don't you go ahead and make your comments, just, susan, you can follow up if you want right. let's see i mean i i use the word test to refer to force people to make a decision to the foot bring them to the fork in the road Okay. And I use the word temptation to lead them into the wrong decision to make take the wrong fork on the road. That I that, and that may be just, just be the perfect way to separate those out. Susan, go ahead again if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah I was just going to say I thought you did a good job of deciphering. Okay. And um, it was in line with what I thought. I just was curious what other people's thoughts were. Yeah. It, Sometimes it's hard to put things into word, but words, but that's why we have people like George and Ron in here too. <laughs> well, and I think it's important too, because I think as people go along, right, we, we know that testing has an equation to it and it has a, a godly purpose. And tempting doesn't have a godly purpose. It has the devil's purpose, right? Yeah. So God's yeah. not going to do that. But he, you know, the devil, devil can see what might catch our eye or catch our thoughts. God, like you said, is not looking to basically trip us up, but the testing does have godly intent. So I think that's part of the difference between the two. And I think you hit hit upon that. I just was wanted to throw it out there in case. No, that's there a great. Was a well, and and not only, yeah. you know, when on God's side of it, it's it's a blessing. You know, God putting us in a situation where we need to, you know, have our faith tested is a growing thing and a blessing. Go ahead, uh, David Deacon. Is is there? A is maybe the difference between it testing and allowing to be tested that god allows us to be tempted by others by satan by our own temptations by our own desires uh is there you know an idea of allowing god allows temptation but doesn't do it i mean he definitely does allow it yeah there's no doubt about that so yeah that's a good point to be put alongside all those others i think yeah yeah, that's, that's great because it's, you know, it's, you know, there's no doubt that God allows um, evil, even not just temptation, but actual evil. To take so, yeah, Chris. Um, or Susan, go ahead. I was, say, I was just going to say in, in line with allowing, that's one of my biggest beefs with God. Not that I should have any beef with him, but yeah. one of my bigger struggles is Anytime I get in a situation where I wouldn't have cho chose it or something bad that I would define bad happened, or most people would, um, I have to always remember he allowed it, right? And, and, and to wrestle with that for a moment because he can, he can stop prevent anything that's going on, right? And so I have to go one way or the other. I either have to go and start hating him and, and judging him, or I have to lean towards that there is a bigger thing that's going on and I have to trust that he's allowing it for a bigger purpose and 
sometimes in that bigger purpose, things happen to people we think shouldn't happen to. But it's all a blink of an eye and a vapor in the wind when it's all said and done, right? Yes, and I, I would say with along with that, that his allowing something doesn't mean he wants it. And I absolutely, think that's absolutely. That's yep. a big distinction to make, yeah. So, yep. Now God has the power to bring good out of the bad. If we didn't yes. have a good God, you know, that the Romans 8 thing could never work. But God brings good out of the bad. He can, he can, that's how he gets the devil, I think, sometimes. He, the ultimate thing is the cross, of course. He brings good out of that bad. Um, and, uh, but, but even with the other little things, he's able to bring good out of it. Um, uh, Sandy, go ahead. And then Donna. Well, one thing, everybody, I don't know how to get this hand to go away. I'm sorry. I don't know. Oh, don't worry about it. No, if you unmute, I'll, I'll see it. It's okay. One thing, everybody, God, God made everything so that we wouldn't have any of these problems. He made everything perfect. He, it was Adam and Eve and the serpent that did all this to us. Yeah. And it brought a, and, and it's free will. And it's, he, I mean, God didn't want all this for us. He didn't want us to have all these problems that we have. He didn't want that, but others did. And he, I mean, they did it. They, they're the ones that did it to us. And when I always think of a temptation as the devil and the test God, the temptation, it, 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 it's the free will. And it's, I, I don't know how to explain it. I hate it when people blame things on God or say, you know, why God do you do, you let this happen or you, because it's not God, it's, it's, it's the devils. And if you turn to God to help you get out of it or help you yeah. with it, whatever it is, that's then that's you and that's your heart and that's and that's God that's to me that's part of what God yeah, is that's, yeah that's great yeah. that's great I I um and you you guys have heard me say before if you want to know what God really wanted for us go to the Garden of Eden or go to Revelation and look about and look at heaven because that's what he really wanted for us so you're right Sandy all this and we're going to look at this in just a second Adam and Eve uh, they, they did. They put us in this situation, but I don't. I, I think so eventually some human would have sinned, and uh, and we would have had the fall. But uh, go ahead, Donna. I was thinking that um, you know when we resist a temptation, um, then I guess I think it should strengthen us, strengthen our faith, um, knowing that that's how we resisted it is through God's strength. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, should increase our, our faith when we do resist a temptation. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, I agree 100%. That, that, that should be a huge encouragement for us. And, um, and God gets the glory for that. You know, anytime we do something good, it's, it's God that gets the credit. And uh, so, yeah, that's great. I think that's, that's super. So the other thing I wanted to say about these two little introductory verses is, um, you know, that to be tempted, we want to avoid being tempted. It's great if we can avoid the enticement, if we can avoid being lured. Um, but when those things happen, we have not sinned. Uh, being tempted is not sin. And um, and that's super important for us to remember, because I've, I've met several Christians over the years who, um, they, they just, they get all guilt ridden just because they were tempted. And um, well, I shouldn't have even been tempted. Well, Jesus was tempted, like all of us, yet without sin. And so, you know, if, if Jesus was tempted, there, there's no sin in it. That's just how we need to look at it. There's no sin in being tempted. Um, when we're tempted, we need to make the right decision. We need to go the right direction um, and say no to the temptation, whatever it might happen to be. But to be tempted is not equal with sinning and that, that's important otherwise jesus sinned and uh you know and we know that's not true so and he was tempted just like all of us so that's an important distinction to make um so the, the title for this lesson is is temptation entered um but of course adam and eve fell into it they they committed the sin they they weren't just tempted you know they fell and uh so that's an important uh, thing for us to to remember i think 
And then the other, uh, well, there are a few more passages referenced in the introduction, but I'm going to hit those when they apply to the segments of the lesson. But here, uh, the last one before we get into our text. Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires. But whoever does the will of God abides forever. So, you know, we're going to have slip-ups. We're going to have times where we give in to the temptation. But our goal is to not allow ourselves to put the world things, desires of the flesh, desires of the eyes, pride of life, above the Father. Uh, that last line, whoever does the will of, the, the will of God abides forever. And that's our goal. When we have that temptation out there, picking what God would want us to pick as opposed to what we might in the moment be tempted to do, but we say no to it and we follow uh, the way God wants us to. So the, the first little section here, verses one through five, uh, talking about the serpent. Um, the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And it was almost an aside in the booklet, but it's important for us um, to realize that the serpent was made by God. Uh, we don't have some kind of um, Eastern dualism. You know, we didn't have the, the, the good God and the evil God side by side for all eternity. Um, you know, that is not the case. That's not Christian thought. Yin yang is not a Christian thing. Uh, the dark and the light being equal is not a Christian thing. A lot of movies have done wonderful, have had wonderful stories based on the, along those kind of lines, and I'm not bashing the movies at all. It's just not the godly way to look at the world um, and not the way that he set it up. Uh, it, it started God, and God is good, <laughs> and it ends there <laughs> with God. And uh, we're in this middle part. And, you know, we don't, we, well, we don't really know why uh, God created and why he set up this whole situation, uh, but he did. And we have to, we have to answer that God doesn't do things haphazardly. God doesn't do things randomly, that it was worth it and good uh, to create human beings, even though they were going to sin, even though God, the son was going to have to go to the cross, you know, despite all the negatives, uh, worth it and good and right and just and holy uh, for God to do his creative work. And so, um, so anyway, the Lord God made the serpent. Uh, again, no kind of yin yang kind of thing going on here with good and evil. Um, uh, good is victorious, <laughs> which is awesome. I mean, even from the beginning, um, you know, we allow Satan to win some little battles when we sin, but uh, the victory is won in Christ. Um, and, uh, you know, that's just the case. That's just the way it is. But anyway, he did make that little aside. I thought that was good. That's a good point uh, to bring out. Um, and then he said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And so just bringing up doubts, and we're going to see in what Satan says, you know, there's truth in the stuff he says, um, but just peppered with falsehood and, and doubt and and just getting Eve to look at it in a way that should have never been. I mean, he definitely was tempting. He was definitely, he deserves his name, the deceiver, uh, for sure. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree, excuse me, that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So he, and we know because Eve gives in, she, she eats and Adam eats, and so he, he does his job well, the serpent here, in, in, in luring her, in enticing her, uh, to do uh, the wrong thing. Um, he's, you know, half truths. You will sh not surely die. Well, she's not going to die at that moment. She takes a bite out of the apple, uh, but she will die. She'll die spiritually. She'll die physically eventually. Um, 
you know, and he gives her a truth. When you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. Now, being like God, you know, again, kind of a half truth, being like God in the sense that you'll know good from evil, but not being like God, not like him in his nature. So just a lot of, a lot of deceit, a lot of trouble here uh, that the serpent gives her. Um, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Um, another passage here. Um, they answered him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would be doing the works Abraham did. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth that I heard from God. This is not what Abraham did. You are doing the works your father did. They said to him, we are not born of sexual immorality. We have one father, even God. Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me. For I came from God and I am here. I, I think I meant a different passage there. Let me see here. Sorry about that. I just flipped through here. Oh, okay, okay. No, it's, it's the right place. <laughs> Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I came from God and I am here. I came not of my own accord, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to hear my word. You are of your father, the devil, and your will is to do your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. So this is this is talking about uh, the temptation. Um, let's talk about the devil, talking about the serpent. Um, a murderer from the beginning. He does not stand in the truth because there's no truth in him. So even though the serpent was saying things close to the truth, being close to the truth is what gets us in a lot of trouble sometimes with sin. Uh, we kind of make excuses or we kind of see something and uh, it's okay this time or whatever the case may be. Um, but this is what he does. When he lies, he speaks out of his own character, for he is a liar and the father of lies. But because I tell the truth, Jesus speaking, you do not believe me. Which one of you convicts me of sin? If I tell the truth, why do you not believe me? Whoever is of God hears the words of God. The reason why you do not hear them is that you are not of God. And so just a, a separation of the character of the evil one and the character of the good one, uh, God Almighty. And then a final one here. So whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it for him, it is sin. Um, it would have been nice for um, Adam to maybe step in or Eve to say, you know, just, but this is, this is just what, um, this is what happened. This is what we, uh, this is what occurred to bring us to where we are uh, today. So um, any comments on verses 1 through 5 before we jump into 6 to 13? Sorry. Yeah, George, go ahead. So it's interesting, taking from the basis of Satan being an angel, Hebrews says angels are to help us. And obviously, Satan didn't like that idea <laughs> and uh, went the other route. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Uh, he went from servant to... Um, to the deceiver, the one who hurts, one who pulls us the other way. Yeah, Ron? I just find it interesting, uh, two things, really. It's interesting that the serpent spoke. As far as I know, we don't have any snakes that speak today. Right. And also, the punishment of the serpent was that he was to crawl on the ground which tells me that however he got around, it wasn't crawling. Yeah, yeah. And um, yeah, we just don't know a lot about that. But the, the first thing you mentioned, um, um, uh, say, that, oh, the speaking. Yeah, I, I can't remember if it was the booklet or another commentary I read. I think it was in the booklet. Um, Chad mentioned, you know, Eve wasn't surprised by that, or at least we're not given any indication that she, she was surprised that some serpent was talking to her in the garden. So for whatever reason, that seemed normal to her. And then that's not to imply that animals were talking or anything at the time, just in this interaction, you know, it, it the interaction did take place. So yeah, that's interesting. And then of course the curse on the serpent, interesting uh, as well, which we'll, we'll get to, but yes, um, 
and who knows, it might've been, I mean, we just don't know. Maybe the serpent was more like an alligator, you know, with, with legs like that. Um, and, and it could be that we just don't even have a good picture in our mind at all of how it was. But, uh, but the serpent might have, like I said, been more like an alligator or a crocodile. And then afterwards, uh, the serpent itself, you know, um, if a snake, uh, you know, crawling around or, or going around on its belly. So, um, and there, there's some people feel that this is, you know, that, uh, you know, that there's a, there, that enmity, enmity um, is there, that uh, there's a, you know, there's kind of a natural born fear of snakes um, in uh, a lot of people. And um, it could be born out of this. But anyway, thank you, Ron, very, very much. So, okay, let's look at 6 through 13 here. Um, so, and we get back to our first John passage, uh, really here, she, you know, hey, the not, 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 uh, well, the lust of the eyes, um, lust of the flesh, you know, this, this looked good. And that's what we really need to avoid when we're facing temptation. We need to avoid um, being sucked in by what looks good to us and what feels good to us. And, you know, God's will should be number one, not what, not what's looking good to us. And that's a, you know, that Paul said, I do things I don't want to do. I, I don't do things I want to do. You know, there's a, there is true spiritual warfare going on and, um, and a true struggle among human beings uh, to do the right thing. Uh, we've been empowered though. We've been empowered by the spirit. We've been empowered by the word and uh, we can, you know, like we read, we're not going to be tempted beyond what we can bear. Uh, there will be a way of escape. Uh, but here, the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise. So the pride there, almost everything working into this passage that we read about in First John. She took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened. And they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves uh, loincloths. They heard the sound. So not only um, uh, did they want to hide from each other, not only did they make these, uh, you know, makeshift uh, clothing, um, but uh, um, but they wanted to hide from the Lord. Then and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and the man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And this is not going to, you know, hide, hiding from God. <laughs> we could look at Jonah and some other uh, examples, but it doesn't, it doesn't go well. Uh, but when the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat. The man said, and this is an unfortunate response. We'll get to this in a second. But the man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, almost blaming God, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. Um, Victor Hamilton is quoted in the booklet, Unlike God's earlier questions, which solicited general information, in this interrogation, God becomes prosecutor. But rather than charge the man with transgression, God allows the man to acknowledge his crime. Thus, the question urges confession rather than condemnation. And I, I really, really liked this. Um, and, you know, and I'm not rating uh, the... the the truth of it, it seems to be, I mean, this is a way to look at this. Um, but that would be just like God, would it not? I mean, him wanting to still loving, still loving Adam and Eve, of course, wanting to encourage the thing that would be best for them spiritually, which would be a confession, a, a coming forward, a humbling themselves before the Lord, just as it is true today. Um, unfortunately, in their responses, uh, they both play a little bit of the blame game. Um, Adam blaming Eve and then indirectly blaming God for giving Eve to him. And then Eve, of course, uh, blaming the serpent. So it would have been much better if, if Adam would have said, 
you know what, God, I, um, yeah, I ate some of that fruit and I shouldn't have. I knew exactly what I was doing and I'm sorry. Um, but that's not, that's not what we have, unfortunately. Um, we need to be careful as well uh, in our confessions, uh, whether it's to God himself or our confessions to one another, as we're commanded to do. I think that's something we really need probably all of us to work on um, a little better. But um, in our confessions, we just need to be straightforward. I'm a sinner. Just like the when Jesus compared the two prayers, uh, the one who exalted himself and then the other man who said, Father, forgive me, I'm a sinner. And we know who went home justified. It was the man who just said, I'm a sinner. And uh, so we need to be uh, similar in our uh, confessions. Um, 2 Corinthians 11.3 says, But I'm afraid that as the serpent deceived Eve by his cunning, your thoughts will be led astray from a sincere and pure devotion to Christ. So when Paul wrote the people in Corinth, he wanted to make sure that they wouldn't fall into the same traps uh, that Eve fell into. And notice the contrast, um, uh, as opposed to be, as opposed to being like Eve, um, we want to be sincere and purely devoted, uh, of course, to Jesus Christ. So pretty, pretty cool uh, passage there. Um, and then another one that just reminds us the battle we're in. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Um, his being cunning, his being crafty, his being scheming. Uh, we're told that he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour in uh, First Peter. Um, you know, he's, he's after us, and that's, we're not used to having people after us like that. And it is very disturbing that there be a being at all in existence that that's his goal. I just, I don't understand when people, and we have human, you know, we have people who do this. Um, if they're going to go down, they're going to make everyone go down with them. You know, I just have never understood that. Um, you know, but that's Satan uh, by definition. He's going down and he wants everyone to go down with him, which is really uh, just absolutely terrible. So any any comments on uh, verses 6 through 13, that last section there, or temptation in general? We've talked a lot about it, but if anyone has anything to add, that'd be welcome and fine. Okay, so let's look at these, um, these curses. Um, and obviously we're, we're dealing with these today. Um, when um, it, I think it's a, it's not a bad exercise. I'm not t telling anyone to do it. Um, and I probably don't do it every time. But if I see a dead animal in the road, if I see a dead branch in a tree, I mean, these are signs of the fall. You can, you can look at these things and be reminded that we are in a fallen world. It's a messed up place and, and allow it to, you know, kind of bring, we can allow those things to bring us back around to a, 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 a thinking about God, a thinking about sin, a thinking about where we fit in the equation. And of course, we've given our lives to Christ. And so, you know, we need to avoid um, the, the bad things of the world. Um, and so, you know, allow the things around us to, you know, remind us of the truths, big giant theological truths that should be a part of our, of our memory. So, so Genesis 3, let me shut my door here. Sorry about that. I've never had someone come in the office on Saturday night. Okay, so here are the curses. Um, Genesis 3, 14 to 19. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock, and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. And so, as, as Ron brought up to us earlier, he, you know, it's, it's, there's been a change. There's a change now. And, um, and you know, we don't know exactly, but we know what's true. He's going to crawl around on his belly now. And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring and her offspring, uh, literally seed, between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
So uh, most consider this, and almost without uh, contest, uh, this is the first messianic prophecy that um, that Christ will defeat Satan. Um, even though Satan will bruise his heel, even though Satan will get Jesus a little bit, uh, but nothing compared to the victory of the cross. Um, the, the booklet references the end of Romans, uh, where um, it says, let me uh, pull that out. Uh, Romans 16, I forget the verse. Just a second. Uh, Romans 16, 20. The God of peace will crush Satan under your feet. I mean, wow. So anyway, um, so that that's the curse on the serpent. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. And all you women in here who have had children, um, you can attest to that. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be contrary to your husband. I don't, I don't necessarily like that uh, translation there in the ESV. Uh, but he shall rule over you. And let me, okay, that's the end of the. Now here, your desire shall be, uh, normally it's rendered for your husband. Um, and most people feel that this might be part of the reason, or may be the reason, uh, that women stay in abusive situations, um, and um, and I, 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 it's probably true. This is not. This is part of the curse. So this is not just saying, you know, women, you're going to love your husbands, or he's going to be the head of the household, and you're going to be subject. To, you know, th that stuff was in place already before the curse. So this curse has to mean something, and this desire for your husband is is a negative thing. And, and I think it is that I think we've seen enough in psychiatry and psychology and enough uh, behavior in, um, in women and their willingness to stay in situations that can really become, you know, life threatening. Um, it's, it's probably because of this. It's probably because of this, this, I don't want to say unnatural, this excessive desire or attachment uh, to the one with whom they've had sex. So the, the first sexual encounter for a woman is so important. I mean, we just, we need just need to be really educational with our teens and with our, uh, whatever age is appropriate to begin to, to help our young ladies realize, you know, you do not want to have a sexual experience um, with a guy before it's your husband, because it is going to cause an attraction and a bond um, that can be unhealthy. And, and most women survive that whole stretch of their lives, you know, pretty much fine. Um, but for some, it can be devastating and awful. And of course, we need to teach our guys. Um, we don't, there are some twisted guys out there. So we sure don't want to teach them that there's some kind of, you know, and it's not power, that they, that, that there's something there. But for our Christian guys, hopefully we can teach them, you know, hey, it's it's nothing to mess around with. You know, sexual activity of any form before marriage is is dangerous. And and I think this is part of the reason. And we do not, and I, I think it's part of the reason some guys can just walk away from stuff, walk away from sex. You know, it's a, it doesn't have the same pull on a guy that it has on a girl. And uh, that just seems to be some of what's happening here. We don't know that for sure, though, but that seems to be part of it. Yeah, Ron, go ahead. I was just going to say that the uh, edition of the English Standard that I have uh, reads, uh, your desire shall be for your husband. Okay, which is the which is the, uh, the you know what, this might be Christian Standard, this might be CSB. Um, and um, what's on the screen? I, I may have messed that up because I, in my, um, and I was doing both PowerPoint preps on the same day. And um, I'm doing one class where I'm using Christian Standard more. So that might be what that is because I didn't think this was how the ESV read until it uh, popped up. But thank you, Ron, for clarifying that. So your the desire for your is, husband. Go ahead. The, the CSB reads for your husband. Well, I wonder where I, where did I get this crazy reading? I'm just kidding. 
<laughs> I just cut and paste. I didn't type it. So anyway, that's yeah. I'll have to look. I'll I'll look for that. I'll try to figure that out. But thank you, Ron. That's and I think that's the proper. That's the more conventional reading. Your desire shall be for your husband, and that's and that's how it should be. That's a that's a good translation there. So to Adam, he says, because you've listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. Um, by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken, for you are dust, and to dust you shall return. So this, what we read here in verses 14 to 19 is the fall with a capital F. I mean, this is the, well, the fall would technically be the actual sinning. And then this, this, these are the results of the fall. Uh, the curse on the serpent, the curse on woman, the curse on Adam slash the earth, uh, kind of together. And of course, Adam's name means the earth. <laughs> Adam um, is, uh, is the earth in Hebrew. So kind of kind of one of the same curse. Um, I usually say four: the serpent, woman, man, and the earth. And that and that's fair to say. But really, three different um, statements from God addressed to the three different people. He addresses the serpent, he addresses Eve, and then he addresses Adam. So this is the state we're in, and we'll be in this state. We'll be in the state of the fall. We'll be in this uh, place of uh, um, some agony and pain, and of course death. Uh, we'll be involved in this until uh, Christ comes back again. Um, uh, Romans 5, 12 to 15, I mean, Romans 5, 12 to 14. Therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. For sin indeed was in the world before the law was given, but sin is not counted where there is no law. Yet death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sinning was not like the transgression of Adam, who was a type of the one who was to come. So a lot of times in scripture, uh, we have the first Adam, we have the last Adam. The first Adam is the Adam we just read about. The last Adam is Christ. And Adam, the first Adam, is considered a type of Christ, um, not, not because he was uh, good necessarily, but because he was the one who brought death. And now it's, it's uh, I guess, an antithetical. Um, he brought death, Christ brings life. He brought sin, Christ brings forgiveness, um, et cetera, et cetera. So um, pretty, pretty neat there. And then 1 Corinthians in our great big resurrection chapter, uh, we read, for as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. And then down in verse 45, and verse 45 is right, really in my favorite part of 1 Corinthians 15, uh, right after it describes the difference between what is sown and what is raised up, resurrected, um, then Paul writes, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So, you know, the first Adam was the first living one. Uh, the last Adam, Christ, he gives life to to all. And really neat, really neat poetic language and uh and not just, I don't mean poetic as in not literal. I mean, it, it's, it's true stuff. So um, in, its, in its very essence. Um, uh, then just to finish out the uh, chapter, the man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. So God doesn't stop giving. He doesn't stop being Jehovah Jireh. He doesn't stop being the provider. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out of the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And, you know, kind of as we talked about at the beginning, I don't know if... Um, if those things were there till the flood, I don't know if they were just there for a hundred years or a thousand years or just for a few months. You know, we just we just don't know. We know they're not there now. Um, NASA's satellite photograph would have caught it. <laughs> I'm just I'm half being silly, but um, 
you know, for whatever time, you know, that was set up that way. And then, and then at some point it all, it all changed right there. Um, might be underwater at this point. Um, I mean, who knows, but um, any comments, any questions? Um, it's already getting close to five till. So we'll just, we'll kind of leave it there. Um, after any comments, any of you want to make or any questions, I'll be glad to look, you know, for things for next week, if there's anything like that. Is it your understanding that, is it your understanding that before they ate of the uh, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that they could have eat of the tree of life? Because I don't think there's ever really a stricture against eating of the tree of life. Well, and, and that might have been what was, you know, without sin, what would have allowed them to live forever. You know, they might have just had the, the tree of life. We're told in Revelation um, that the tree of life is there in heaven. And uh, now in the case in heaven, I think the tree of life spreads over the river that is through the city, kind of on both sides. So that's kind of cool. Um, and again, the stuff in Revelation is very figurative. It could just be referencing back to we will have nourishment forever, you know, that kind of idea. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know for sure, David, but yeah, it's, it seems like it. So I would, I would agree with that uh, conjecture. That's always the way I'd understood it, yeah. but I just, yeah. I don't think I'd ever heard anybody say it. Yeah, and I guess we're just not told explicitly, but that makes sense, you know, for sure. Yeah. And that, and they're, they're, the forbidden tree was not that one. It was the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, like you said. So, yeah, good point. Anything else, anyone? Yeah, Ron, go ahead. I just was going to note that a couple of changes evidently occurred as a result of this sin. The first one was that weeds began to appear. Yeah. Um, and and so, uh, and then the second one that strikes me is it appears that animals did not die before this. And that God in taking the skin uh, foresaw the change in the animals as well as mankind. Yeah, I, I agree with you, Ron. I think um, I, I I think before the fall there was no death at all. I, I think you're I think that's correct. I think um, you know again when we see a dead branch in a tree or a dead animal, I think it's a result of the fall. I don't think anything would have died before that. You know, I, I again we're not explicitly told that, but that seems to make sense, and I think most people feel that way. So yeah, yeah, very good. So. All right. Well, thank you all. Uh, David Mays, if you're able to um, uh, unmute, if you'd leave us in a closing prayer, that'd be great. Sure. Dear Lord and Father, we once again come to you with, with thankfulness for all that you have provided for us, for your concern for us, that you wish us to be yours. You wish us to, to be in a state like Adam and Eve were before the fall and we, we thank you for all that you've done to make that possible for us to, to, to be restored to a relationship with you. We pray that you help us to, to continue to seek your will and your word and to follow it and to be a light to others so that they too might know you. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen.